Thanks for tuning in. Pastor John here. We're in the series called Go Time. It's what the church should be all about. It's, it's go time for us because Jesus did his go time in winning our salvation. And he sends us out on a going mission to share that good news with other people. Well, today's message seven in the series, and it's this. It's time to toughen up. It's what disciples needed to do before they went out. They needed to be tough so they wouldn't give up and quit. And it's important that we understand that or else that's what's going to happen. The first minute persecution comes or someone gets angry or doesn't agree with us, then we'll want to quit instead of just hanging in there and watching God work as there'll be times when it'll be in season and out of season. So if you have your Bible, look up Ezekiel chapter 2, 1 to 5. It's Ezekiel's call to be a prophet. Uh, 2 Timothy 4, 1 to 5. It's Paul encouraging young Timothy to preach the word and to endure the hardships that will come. And then Mark chapter 6, verses 1 to 13. And you'll see Jesus uh, helping to toughen up his disciples as he takes them to his own hometown where Jesus is rejected by his own family and people who are there. So get ready for a powerful message. I know this one's for you. Hi, and welcome. Katrina Watkins here. You're back with another powerful message with First Lutheran Church. I'd like to say a huge welcome back to Pastor and Karen. They were out of town visiting with family, and I hope we got an A-plus while they were out of town. The church is still standing. Do me a favor, if you're joining us live on Facebook, like and share this message so that your friends and family can be blessed all week long by today's message. Monday, July the 8th, LWML will be meeting at 1230 in the Fellowship Hall. Any women that are available, you're all invited to meet. We'll see you there. Speaking of LWML, congratulations are in order. They've been awarded the LWML Mid-South District Grant. Congratulations, ladies. Your hard work is amazing. This Monday, we'll be serving at the Jackson House. There are plenty of opportunities to help get connected. If you would like to help, contact myself or Miss Linda Colley and we can get you connected. We will resume watching Chosen Season 4, Tuesday, July the 9th. We will be showing at 10.30 and at 6.30 every Tuesday. There's two opportunities to get connected. Come and watch these exciting episodes and we'll discuss and reflect on Jesus' ministry from each episode. We'll see you there. This week, we will be welcoming back Jerry and Valerie Backus all the way from Tanzania. They're also gonna be bringing along baby Tommy. So with that being said, July the 14th, we'll be having our congregational potluck where they will update us on uh, baby Tommy and everything going on at the orphanage there in Tanzania. So if you'd like to participate in our congregational potluck, there's a sign-up sheet out front. We'd love to have you and love to see you there. If you want to find out all things going on here at First Lutheran Church, go over to www.flchsar.com and there you'll find all things going on right here at First Lutheran and even sermon notes for today's sermon. If you're a visitor or a member, we have Connect Cards. We'd love to know that you're worshiping with us or if you have a special need or if you need us to pray for you. Write it on the back of that Connect card and we'd love to know and we'd love to pray and touch and agree with you. It looks like it's time for service to get started. Pastor John, take it away. All right. It's great to be back in person and to be with our church family uh, to celebrate all that Jesus has done. So let's stand. Let's prepare our hearts as we're going to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords today. Lord Jesus, we love the habitation of your house, the place where your glory dwells. Even though the temple long ago was destroyed, you have come to inhabit our lives as that living temple where you dwell. And among your people, you're building that temple where your glory dwells as we gather together in your name. You're the one we long for. You're the one we need. And there's nothing else that will do. Nothing can take your place. We have come desiring more, more of that life that is life, more of the love and the joy 
the peace and the patience that comes through your spirit as you dwell within, as we live in the finished work of what you did for us on Calvary, as we live in triumphant procession and live in the joy of lifting you high. So Holy Spirit, come. Jesus, bless us with your presence. Father, you are so good and you are so amazing and we thank you that we are yours. So have your way, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. We are in a series called Go Time, and by the end of the season, you're going to go, wow, I didn't know there was so much stuff in Go Time. Here's what you need to understand. God did everything he was supposed to do. He created this world and all things. He called out the children of Israel to be to go on a mission. They had a go time to be light, and light to the Gentiles and everybody would see who he is by the way he loved them and dealt with them and called them the way they lived. And then Jesus came. He fulfilled his mission through his life, death, and resurrection and our place for us for everything that is needed. That's why we can speak his name because we get everything he, he bought for us there. But then, right before he ascended, he said, all right, now it's go time for you. You're my ambassadors. You're my witnesses. You're my light. You're my salt for the world. You're my testifiers of all that I've done. And for almost 2,000 years now, it's been go time. And so much of God's word has to do with go time. It really does. So today is this in the go time. He wants us to know. In go time, it's time to toughen up. How many people have ever said that to you? Anybody ever said that to you? Time to toughen up. Get dressed. You're going to school. <laughs> Come on. That's what we do. I can remember one of the times it happened to me. Like it was yesterday. It was when I went out for high school football when I was in the ninth grade. Back then we didn't have Pee Wee League, so it was really my first taste of football. And what a shocker. It was. I can honestly say that I lived a pretty sheltered life up to that point. I did no clue. Well, I'm going to preach. Oh, how did that happen? Things were going to change, and they changed quickly when I went out for high school football. First, it started with this. It started with two a days in the summer. Not good. It was hot. My face was in the grass. <laughs> Not only that, it started with running. How many of you like running? Come on. We ran and we ran and we ran and we ran. Then we did blocking drills. Then we did tackling drills. Then we did kickoff drills. And then we put on pads. And things really changed. It really got rough, especially for a shy, lightweight, naive ninth grader going against these huge, seasoned seniors. And they loved it. I have never seen people smile so big. Daryl Weston in the Saturday service, he shouted it out. Fresh meat. <laughs> That's what it was. And all of that was for this one purpose. It was to toughen us up and prepare us to play in a real game. You know, at the time, I didn't understand it at all. I just did what I was told. I, I just did it. But now, looking back, I can see how important it was for game day. You see... One thing, we need to know what to do, how to block, how to tackle, what the plays were. But on the other thing, we needed to be toughened up because we're going to get hit all throughout the game for four whole quarters, for a whole season. And if we're not ready for that, what would happen is after the first kickoff, everyone would quit. What? They're going to hit us? And it's going to hurt? What? They're mean. See, that practice was used to toughen us up. If some of you didn't play football, some of you, how about this? How many of you ever served in the armed forces? Basic training. 
Am I telling you anything? Basic training. They're toughing you up. They're teaching you some things about the military, how it's supposed to function, but they're toughing you up so that when you get in war and all of a sudden, oh, they're shooting at us. <laughs> I want you to understand how important it is to, that we get toughened up. Looking back, I see that playing football, and I played four years. <laughs> I just kept going. I began to like it. I began to understand it. But anyway, I learned looking back that it also prepared me for the hard life challenges that I would face later on in life where I would want to quit and give up. It prepared me to stay tough, to hang in there, that it's worth it in the end to do the hard thing. And it also prepared me for living for Christ and for sharing the good news about Him. Because you see, it's tough when you do it. 2 Timothy chapter 3, Paul comes right out and says it this way. Anyone or everyone who wants to live a godly life will be, anybody know the answer? Persecuted. What does that mean? They're going to come at you. They're going to say bad things about you. They're going to do everything in their power to get you to stop. Paul says you need to know this ahead of time. Don't be surprised by the hatred and praise or cursing you face when you want to live godly. Prepare for it so that when it happens, you're not overwhelmed by it and want to quit. Just know it's a part of life. If you want to live a godly life, here's the deal. There's only two alternates, two, 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 two ways, and the other way is even worse. It's to live ungodly and not be persecuted at all. But again, the world, it's, it's not a good ending. But to live godly, to know that the darkness doesn't like the light. When you live upright in God's ways, people get angry because they're not like that. And they got to put you down, and they can't be in that light because it exposes they're not living that way. So Paul says, he tells ahead of time, 2 Timothy 3, get ready. Whoever wants to live a godly life, it's going to happen. You're going to need to toughen up. Jesus told his disciples the same thing in John chapter 16, verse 33. He had just told them in the upper room, he's in the upper room about, it's going to get tough. He doesn't really go into specifics, and they're kind of, it's kind of going over their head. He tells them that, but then he says this. He says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. I told you it's going to get rough out there, but just know that in me you'll have peace. In this world you will have trouble. Who knows what trouble is? It's bad, Right? In this world, this world is full of trouble. How many of you have noticed that? Yes. See, this is what you need to know. It's out there. You're going to face it wherever you go in this world. It's trouble. But take heart, Jesus said, because I have overcome the world. In me, you're going to have peace that passes understanding. That will guard your heart and mind. In me, you're going to be on the winning team. In me, you're going to walk in triumphant possession. When you live in me, it's going to be okay. Just know that it's coming so it doesn't surprise you and knock you down and make you want to quit. Jesus prepared his disciples by telling them what to do, but by helping them to know it's going to be hard. He prepared them for go time. He prepared them for game day. He prepared them for being witnesses. He prepared them for making disciples of all nations because that's what they were there to do. So it's really what we see happening in all three lessons today. People are getting prepared for the hardships to come. First of all, as you heard Clyde read, sec Ezekiel chapter 2. Ezekiel here is being called by God to be a prophet. 
He says, I'm calling you. I love how it says this. he was filled with the Spirit and he, it raised him to his feet. He had to stand up in God's presence that way. And he was empowered to do it. And he tells them this. He says, Son of man, I am sending you to the Israelites. Can you say trouble? Trouble. I'm sending you to the Israelites to a rebellious nation. They're bad. They have been in revolt against me to this very day. They will not stop. They're fighting against me. Ezekiel, you need to know who I'm sending you to. These are the Israelites. They are obstinate and stubborn. Do you know anybody like that? Obstinate, stubborn? God says, I'm sending you to them. And you already know, it's not going to be fun. They're hard to work with. They don't want to change. They want to do everything and make everybody else conform to their image and what life's all about. That's what the Israelites were doing. We want it our way. We want some of you only when we need you. But we want these pagan gods because they're more fun. I want to live where the fun is, where I think all these things is. But it's really disaster. But God wants them. And so he sends them a prophet, Ezekiel. He tells Ezekiel, say to them what I tell you. You don't go out there. Don't worry about it. I'm going to tell you exactly what to say. Just go. I'm sending you. I'll tell you what to say. Just say what I say. And whether they listen or not, that's the possibility. Some will and some won't. But no matter what happens, they will know that a prophet has been among them. They will hear my word. They will hear me speaking to them. And they'll know that I sent someone because I wanted them. That's why I've sent a prophet. When we go to people, when we say something, it's God really doing it because he wants them. And some will listen, some will not. That, that's not on us. That's what, what God is doing through his word, and he's seeking to draw all people. Our job is to go, to stand, to speak what God says. So God's telling Ezekiel, I'm sending you, but just know. Some are going to listen, some will not. Some will love you. Well, maybe, maybe only a couple. <laughs> Others will not. Probably many. But get ready, because I'm sending you. In 2 Timothy 4, Paul says the same thing to young Pastor Timothy. He tells him about the mission issues he's going to face and how he would need to toughen up. He starts by saying, Peter, fan into flame that gift that has been given to you through the laying on my hands. You're going to need all the fire you can get for the mission you are on. And by the way, God has not given us a spirit of fear. Don't be afraid. He's given us a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. you got everything you need. And then he tells them later on, I love this part. He says, Timothy, don't let anyone look down on you because you're young. But set an example for the believers in speech and love and life and faith and in purity. People are going to want to look down on you because you're young or you're old, you're tall or you're short, because you're in ninth grade. But just set examples, show them what it looks like, let your light shine. That's part of the way I speak to people. And now he gets to the end where Paul is about ready to die. He's going to talk about that in a few, few verses. And he tells Timothy this, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus. See, we're in his presence all the time, and it's, it's his mission. He's the author and giver of the mission. 
And he goes on to tell them how he's going to one day come to judge the world. That's really what's going on in the world. It's heading for this day. It's the most important thing is to be on the right side and not on the left side. It's to know Jesus and the life that he gives. He's coming to judge, and he's going to bring his eternal kingdom with a new heaven and a new earth. He's coming because he wants to usher in this glorious kingdom. It's he wants everybody in it. He made it for all of us, and he wants us all there. That's why Jesus came. So in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, Paul says, I give you this charge. I'm passing it on. I'm going to be gone. You are going to have this responsibility. And he says this, preach the word. Because people need to hear from me, God says. My word is truth. My word will never change. My word is eternal. My word is life. My word has power to transform lives. So, Timothy, I don't want you to preach about anything else. I want you to preach my word so that they will know that a prophet had been among them, that I wanted them, and I sent you to them, and that it was really me. Because if they reject you, if they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting me. So Jesus also said, so Timothy preached the word. And not only that, get ready. Be prepared in season and out of season. In the time when the fruit will come in and even when there is no fruit coming in. Be prepared in season and out of season. No matter what reactions you get, be ready. Because you're going to get different reactions. In season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage. When was the last time you had to correct somebody? Now, wasn't that fun? How many people like to be corrected? Come to the front. No. Correction is so important because, you see, when people are going in the wrong direction, it's going to end up in disaster. We need a course correction. Pastor Anthony talks about that turnaround. That's what correction does. It gets us off the wrong path. That's leading to disaster. And some people, they're obstinate and they're stubborn. And you can tell them the sky is blue and they're going to say, no, it's yellow. It's purple. That right is right and left is left. And they'll say, no, left is right and right is left. And They need the correction so they can be blessed. Rebuke. When I hear the word rebuke, I hear more about the deep underlying issues. It's, it's even the demonic needs to rebuke. It's those things in life that are really stopping people from receiving everything God has. And so it's dealt with. And then he says encourage. Build them up. Let them know this is all good news. God wants you. He's got a plan. He's going to lead you. He's going to strengthen you. He's going to give you everything you need. So Timothy, preach the word. In season, out of season, correct, rebuke, encourage. And do this with great patience and careful instruction which means this, do it in love. Take your time. Love is patient. Love is kind. See, it all goes together. A lot of people want to throw that out. I get to say whatever I want to say and, and do it there, whatever I want to do. 
And if you don't listen, I'm done with you. I'm going to give up. Because I gave you a chance. And you blew it. Great patience says, however long it takes. God says, you know, they may come in at the last hour. That's, that, that's how sometimes the kingdom works. It's okay. I want them. And I'm patient. I want everyone to come to repentance. Great patience, careful instruction, help them to learn and to grow and to receive it in a way they, hear it in a way they can receive it. He says this, keep at it. Don't stop. It's in the text, but it's in the verbs. Verbs in the scripture are very important. Some are just a one-time action. I'll let you know, every time it talks about baptism, it's a one-time action. It's an errorist. But there's an imperfect, which means ongoing and never stop. And so when he's talking to Timothy, he's saying, and keep on keeping on. Keep doing this. Don't ever stop. This is what you're to do. Preach the word all the time. What they need, give them what they need. And do it in a way that they can receive it and that they know that they are loved by me. And this is why I came. I want them. And then he says, for a time will come when people will not listen to you. They will not listen to sound doctrine. They, they will say, I don't want to listen. Nah, 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 nah. Ah. Have you ever had someone not want to listen to you? Yeah. That's okay. He said, the time's going to come when that's going to happen. I want you to be ready. Because again, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me at that moment. But people will not want to do that. Instead, to make themselves happy and to feel good about themselves... They'll get people to tell them what they want to hear. That, by the way, is a John Byer paraphrase. I haven't done the whole Bible yet, but <laughs> paraphrase is I take it and I make it how I want it to say it, but it's kind of like the same thing. This is what it says here. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. But that's really what itching ears want to hear. Just make me happy. Tell me that everything's fine and it's all good. A lot of times it's not. It, see, they'll gather people around them. If they don't like it, they may, they may go somewhere else to somebody else to hear what they want to hear. Yep. But to say, God doesn't care if I keep on sinning. Well, he does. <laughs> Jesus says, it costs me a lot. That way is going to kill you. I want you, you need to come with me. See, when people, that's the life that people want to build around themselves. Just make me happy and tell me what I want to hear. That everything, I'm good. Make me happy. And we've built a rut so deep. I've made my life exactly how I want it to be. And now someone's telling me I gotta, I'm going the wrong way. They're trying to correct me from this life I worked so hard to build. That's what Jesus faced with the Pharisees. They had worked so hard to make that religion all about them. And he came and he said, that way don't work. He corrected. And they got angry, and they rejected, and they hated him. So Paul's telling Timothy, Timothy, get ready. This is what's going to happen. You'll go out there, and it'll be season and not season. There'll be, there'll be good things that will happen, and other times it'll be awful. Yeah. People will want to hear what they want to hear, and they will not want to listen to you or the truth of the words that I give you, God saying through, through his word but it's okay because I'll be with you. He says they will turn away from the truth and believe lies and made-up stories. That's the myths. And then made-up stories is, you know, 
It's just a generic thing. God doesn't care. He doesn't... He just wants you to do something. You can repent just once, and that's all you need, one time in your life. And then, and then when you're done with your life, then God has to take you into heaven and stuff like that. No, it's an ongoing relationship. So they'll believe the myths. Some, that'll happen to some. But he says, but for you, keep your head in all situations. It's really just being aware of what he's doing. You'll know how to work. You'll see what's going on. Your mind has been renewed, so keep your head in all situations, holding on to that truth. Keep your head so that it doesn't get into your heart. See, that's what happens when we're not ready, when we're not tough. It catches us by surprise and we want to quit. You know, I tell you what, I, I want to say it right now. I see that in the church all the time. Yep. Somebody made me mad. You know, and this happened and that. And we go from church to church to church. They go to the next church and then there too. What? This is what the word says and I, I, that's not what I want. And, and somebody made me mad and I go to the next church and pretty soon they're watching online. And then after that, they're just turning the volume down. I don't want to hear it. But God's saying, no, you, this is exactly what you need. You need the truth. You need the word. You need me. And I'm going to keep coming. Because I want everybody to know the truth, the truth that sets free, the, tr the truth that is life in me, Jesus says. So Paul's preparing Timothy. Paul faced all kinds of hardships in his life, and he knew that Timothy would too. So he's saying, Timothy, get ready. You're young, but you've got to toughen up. So get ready. Then in Mark chapter 6, I love this part. Jesus gets his disciples ready. Yeah. And this is how he does it. He takes them to his hometown. He says, all right, guys, come with me. I'm going to show you something. Goes to his hometown, goes to the synagogue, gets up and teaches. And people start going, wow. That doesn't look like the Jesus I remember. Where did you get all this wisdom? Where did you get these things that you're talking about? How and where did you get this ability to perform these miracles? And then the conversation went to, wait a second. Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't Mary his mother and his brothers, the ones we know, and his sisters? And, and they took offense at him. You see, this is what happens when you become too familiar with Jesus. He's no big deal. You don't have something you can say to my life anymore because you're just too familiar. You're just one of us. And when people take someone for granted, they start talking down to instead of appreciating who he is and what he brings. So Jesus tells the disciples, this is what I want you to see, but you see, a prophet is not without honor. Wherever he goes, it's everywhere except one place, in his hometown and among his family in his own home. Have any of you ever discovered that? The hardest people to talk to are your children, maybe your spouse, your brothers and sisters because they remembered you when you had all kinds of stuff coming out of your nose <laughs> and you're always getting in trouble and that's it's just it's just you so Jesus is toughening them up to let them know there are places where it'll become familiar, you'll become familiar. There'll be places where they're just going to do, they're going to become offended at you just like they're offended with me here in my own hometown. And Mark tells us that Jesus couldn't do any miracles there except for drive out a few demons and heal a few people because of their lack of faith, which just shocked them. You know, you'd think that would be the place that they'd be excited that the Messiah comes from their hometown among their people. So he's getting them ready. Then he sends them out, the 12, two by two. And he gives them this instructions of how to go. And he gives them authority over evil spirits. 
I just want to point out that at the end you'll find out they anointed people and healed them, but sometimes the evil spirits are behind the sickness and the illness. Jesus showed that in many times the way he healed. But he says this, this is our instructions. When you go on the journey, take nothing except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in your belts. I don't want you to be dependent on yourself. I can do this because of what I have and who I am. He wants them to be totally dependent on God to provide everything. Because when they're weak, they're strong. They're going to have power for the mission when they don't think they can do it, but they're going to trust God to work in and through exactly what he's telling them to say and to go to whom he's sending them. So don't plan ahead. Just follow and go. And he lets them know they may not be received. That wherever town you go and stay with where you're staying, but if you're not welcomed... If that happens, you are to shake the dust off your feet and move on, which means this. He's saying, don't just keep spending your time there when it's not ready. You've spoken, and they will know that a prophet has been among them. That seed may take root later, but move on to where people are ready to receive, to have their course direction changed to a new way to come alive. He said, this is life on the mission. You're not going to know how good or what, what they're going to say. That's what a lot of people live in fear. What if, they, what if they don't like me? What if they... Jesus says, well, toughen up. It's going to happen. It's life on the journey. It's life in the mission. And it's going to be okay. There's going to be hard times and good things that are going to happen. But this is what Jesus also said, I'm going to be with you. And he's also going to say, I'm going to be in you. I will give you the very words to say. It takes off all the pressure. We just go. Wherever he takes us. And what I love is this. The motivation for doing it is because this is exactly what Jesus did for us. He came to a world which was his own, and his own would not receive him. They rejected him. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, familiar with suffering. Why did he do that? He did it for us. He was tough. He set his face like flint toward Jerusalem because he wants us. He wants us all. Yeah. Yeah. For the love of Christ compels us. Yes, sir. Gotta go. Yeah. 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 He did it for me. <laughs> you see, if we did it because everyone else needs it, and they do, and we keep running into people who just don't want to listen, who are stubborn and obstinate, what's going to happen? It's because we're still human, we'll say, I give up on you. I want to just stay out of it today. I want, to, I want to pull back and stay in my own little cocoon. It was so much easier that way. But when the love of Christ compels you, you can't help but go. Because Jesus is everything. Everything is found in him. And when he comes for us, we're going to see that. And when we get to be with him in heaven, we're going to see it. It's all around Jesus and the throne of God. It's what it's always been all about. That's why we can, can go. And people reject us or get mad at us. That love of Christ is going to fill us up so much that we say, wow. Give me a hug for that. Yeah. Come here. Just come here. Bill. Give me a hug for that. How many of you had a, a child who you want to give them a hug and they're just pushing back? <laughs> you just got to fight through that. Keep on loving. So our take-home points for today is this. As I resolve to share the good news with Jesus, I can endure the hardships that come 
because I know it's a part of sharing Jesus with others. There's going to be hardships. It's just a part of it. Someone's going to come to try to knock me down. That's okay, because it's just a part of the mission. Jesus will be with me. He will protect me. He will protect my heart and my mind, and I'll be okay. And they will learn, and they will know that God wants them so much. They may not know it then, but they will know that a prophet has been among them. Secondly, as I resolve to share the good news of Jesus, I can embrace the rejections that will come. And I will use the word embrace because, one, there's a great reward for when we're persecuted for righteousness and people say all kinds of evil against us falsely because of him. But we can embrace it because that's what God kept doing for us. He kept embracing us and wanting us. And it's not them, it's the enemy who's been at work in them. They need healing. They need hope. They need life in Jesus. Because this too is a part of sharing Jesus with others. And finally, as I resolve to share the good news of Jesus, I can engage in the opportunities that will come. I'm going, all right. I'm going to Kroger's today. It's an opportunity to pray for somebody, to, to love on somebody, just to speak a kind word to somebody. Because the love of Christ in me just wants to bless people in his name. And he will give us so many opportunities. Divine setups and appointments as he determines his exact times and places. I want to quick tell you a quick story about our first service. We welcome a new lady into our church. Her name is Jeanette Bins. This is how she found the church. She started calling around to see if anybody could pick her up. She's looking for churches that had a bus or something. And guess what? We had just gotten one. On. Even had a wheelchair lift. She sits in a wheelchair during church, but she can get up and move around. And she came. And she found a family. God was calling her. And we were ready. And our LWML just got a grant so we can get another one. So one, one bus can go that direction, Steve, and another one can go that direction, and we can pick them all up. Pedro, too. Pedro's getting ready to come back because of his in injury. But that's how the kingdom works. God is always setting things up. It's being our, keeping our head in all situations. This is what it is. This is what you're doing. This is why you're sending me to work. This is what I get to do because you did it for me. And other people can be blessed as well. So Lord Jesus, I pray that you build us all up in that faith to make us courageous as lions, gentle as lambs, tough on the inside, but loving on the outside. In your name, amen. Man, amen. Good work. Time to toughen up. You know, I, I heard this message three times. And uh, Dr. Jeremiah, he said something about one of these scriptures. And he said that this is like one of the saddest scriptures he's heard in the Bible to him for us as believers. When he says... A prophet is not without honor except in his own town. <clears throat> he says he could not do many miracles there except lay hands on a few sick people and heal them because they were so familiar with Jesus. And I, he said that because when pastors up preaching every Sunday, we can't get so familiar with him as Pastor John. The word of God is speaking through him to us. That's why it's so, it's so sad that when the word of God comes forth that we look at the person. But God is speaking a word to his people. So it's time to toughen up. It's time to toughen up. And there's a process in the toughening up. 
And in that process, I know it's, it's time that we stand to your feet and we'll pray for the church. But in the process, I have the privilege of working with my favorite athlete. And I always tell him to trust the process. Trust the process, man. We get up at 5 o'clock in the morning. We work out. We leave there. We go to the high school. We run the Trojan Mile. He run the Trojan Mile. But I tell him to trust the process because it's not easy getting up at 5 o'clock in the morning, working out. It's not easy running those bleachers. Trust the process. And I be telling him that, and he look at me like, the process. But see, time is going to tell the payoff in the process. See, we got a payoff in our process, y'all. We just got to toughen up. See, in the process, that's as we building ourselves. God is building us up for whatever it is we got to face. That's why we're able to face whoever we have to face. Spread his word in love and shake it off when they don't accept it. And the process, man, don't give up on in the process. I mean, Pastor has so many great points, y'all. It was like point after point after point. People, sometimes we can give up so quick in the process. And the thing about the process is when it comes to crisis, you're going to have to take the test again. Sorry. The process can be here at First Lutheran. We can say, you know what? I don't like the way they're doing what they're doing. I'm going to go somewhere else. You know what? You still got to take the same test wherever we go. Because it's all in the process. Amen? Let us pray for the church. Eternal God, we just thank you for your word on today, Father. It's go time, Father. And it's time for us as Christians to be tough in the ministry. Tough in love, Father. Speaking your word in season and out of season, Father. When people want to hear it and don't want to hear it, Father. Going places we go, places we don't want to go. Because you tell us to go, Father. Build us up with the courage that we need, Father. That when people come at us sideways that we can ask them to give us a hug. That we don't take anything personal for they're not rejecting us, for they are rejecting you. So put it in our hearts, Father, to pray for those that reject you. Pray for those who despitefully use us. May we be tough spiritually, Father, to take any type of criticism that may come our way and help our eyes to be fixed like flint. Now, Father, we pray for those that are sick and hurting that need your healing touch, Father. We pray, Father, that you comfort them right where they're at, Father. We pray for our caregivers to take care of those that are sick and hurting. We pray that you refresh their spirits, Lord. Now, Father, we just pray for this world that we live in as we preach your word. We pray, Father, that some soul may be saved, set free, and delivered by your word, the true living word of God. So, Father, we thank you for First Lutheran Church and every church that's preaching Jesus Christ across the world to stay in the fight. Now, Father, we close out the prayer that you taught us to pray, and that prayer is, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. But thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen, amen. Woo. Good word. I missed you guys. But I want to bless you to go out and be that light and salt, that word, that truth, that blessing that people need. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor 
and give you peace. Amen. I pray that God spoke to you through the message today about times in your life when you wanted to quit, when you got so hard that you didn't think you were doing any good. But God is there, and uh, he will bring the fruit from whatever things that you do in his name. So if we can be a blessing to you, give us a call. Love to encourage you, bless you, and, and help you in the journey. Our number is 501-525-0322. And uh, if you want to join us live on Sunday morning, our Facebook page is First Lutheran Church Hot Springs AR. And we come on at 8.30 and 11 o'clock Central Time here in Hot Springs, Arkansas. So God bless you. Get out there and go. Watch God work. He'll give you strength for whatever you face. See you next time.